next destination, California's biggest cat house, located 350 kilometres north of Los Angeles. Hello. Now you're Linnea, right? Uh, yes. Hey, guys. Nice Chris. meeting you. Nice to meet all of you. They came just to say hello. I'm just astounded because there are cats everywhere. Everywhere you look. Rooftops, trees, on the ground, everywhere. Cats. Is it true you have a thousand? We have 800 adults and 200 kittens, so that pretty much counts to a thousand. I've never seen that breed of cat before, though. Poor thing, he's got already has an inferiority complex. The cats pick on him. I'm scared to walk. Where do we need to go here? You have to basically look down. You can't walk with your head up anymore. We're gonna take you in the house and show you what used to be my house, and now it's the cat's house. I moved out about four years ago and gave it to the cats. There isn't one tree or square inch that doesn't have a cat in it, on it, or around it. I am the epitome of a crazy cat lady. I don't say I'm sane or insane. I'm just um, eccentric. <laughs> Watch your step. When Chris walks in that house, he'll just probably stop with his mouth open because it's, it's something that you've never seen anywhere before. He was not very well last night, and then this afternoon when we got home, I found a, a little lump under his neck, rolled him over, and there was quite a big-looking thing. Catherine is concerned that what she found is a deadly paralysis tick. Come on, guys. All three poodles have been together and need to be checked for the life-threatening parasite. But Boots appears to be the only dog affected. Oh, that's a big crater. When did you first notice that something was not right with Boots? Probably last night he was vomiting up his meals. Okay. And since then he hasn't kept anything down. Mm -hmm. Emergency vet Lisa Chimes is convinced that the tick toxin has already begun shutting down Boots' system. Mm -hmm. Boots is definitely showing signs of tick paralysis. His back legs have gone, he's really wobbly, he's falling all over the place. And if we don't treat him straight away, he could get worse very quickly. He's going to need to stay in hospital. We're going to give him some sedation, clipping off all his hair to make sure there's no other ticks. How do we check that they don't? The only way to know for sure is to give them a haircut too. There's always a concern that they, you know, something dreadful happens and they don't make it. And then you've got to go back and tell the children. Jeanette. Yes. Hi, Andrew. I'm Andrew Marchewski. How are you? I'm well, how are you? Well, thank you. There's no guessing which league she's saw, is there? Jeanette has arrived at Sash with Jemima. The short-haired pointer is struggling to walk. Oh, wow. So what happened? Well, for a few months now, she's been on and off lame. On that leg? Yes. Sunday afternoon, she made an enormous sort of screeching noise. Okay. She was at the door shivering and a leg was pulled right up. For a dog not to use a leg, then she's really sore. Specialist surgeon Andrew Marchewski examines Jemima's leg for any clues as to what's causing her lameness. No, she totally ruptured a cruciate. The cruciate ligament keeps your knee stable, so when you're walking around on it, it stops it from sliding around randomly. And she's been charged around the backyard and suddenly it snapped, and that's pretty painful. I mean, I've actually had that done to my knee a few years ago, and I know what it feels like. I think it's likely that she's damaged one of her joint cushions. Right. It's a very important part of the joint, but when it's damaged like that, we'll end up having to remove it, almost certainly. Right. Yeah. When I first see Tillman, you have that moment where it's, it's too bizarre to truly believe. But sure enough, perched on the skateboard as though nothing's really out of the ordinary, is a bulldog flying on by. Is he yours? Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a riot. Well, how does that even happen? How's he, how's he skateboarding? He just, he lives for it. I mean, that's his exercise, like chasing a ball. Just how and why? Chris is about to find out from Tillman's owner, Ron. He's really got it down. I mean, the way he shifts his weight around. And what, he, he just jumped on a board one day? Or yeah. Just as simple I, as that. I had a Rottweiler that would carry a board around with him. It was a, kind of like the toy to have. Tillman just took it to the next level. Every chance he got, Tillman would just run to that skateboard and he'd just do it, do it, do it. You know, he basically taught himself. He just became this great skateboarding dog. You know, we came all the way from Iowa to see stuff like that. <laughs> Thank you. 
I really think Tillman is one of the most amazing dogs on the planet, if not the most amazing dog, because when I look at him, he just shreds. Come here, bud. The really interesting thing about this behavior, and I guess the thing that comforts me, is that this wasn't a behavior that Ron taught him. Tillman took this up all by himself. He didn't have to reward him to do it. Tillman just loved it. We have the emergency here. At the Bondi Referral Hospital, Sash. Hi, I'm Lisa. Hi, how are you? 14 week old Wilson is in agony after a game of chasey turned into disaster. Might just take him out the back and yeah, I'll yeah. pop back out and have a chat to you. No worries. My little sister and her friend were having a play with the dog, I guess, and they were chasing him around and he was jumping. So my sister jumped up on her bed, jumped off the bed and landed on Wilson and could hear the screaming and didn't know what was going on. So I ran upstairs, grabbed the dog, ran him here. When a little dog comes in like this and it's been jumped on, it's so small that he could have really been injured anywhere. So I've just got to start at his head and work down to the tail and assess every part of his body for injuries. And his pupils are symmetrical and responding normally. That does make brain damage less likely. Mm. I'm a little bit worried about this left shoulder. And you can't always feel if something's broken, but he's certainly not liking it at all. I definitely think he's had a big knock to that leg. Wilson. Oh, buddy. Wilson. You've got a sore leg. Wilson is tiny. He's only 1.3 kilos, and a teenager has jumped on him. There's a chance that he's got some massive internal injuries, and we need to take some x-rays to <laughs> confirm that. When Tash first points out Charlie, it looks like a nice horse. Beautiful Appaloosa. Hey, buddy. But once you get closer, you can really see that weight on his eyelid weighing it down. It's a big lump. Wow, that's really something. Where did he actually come from originally, Linda? Um, he was surrendered to us by a lady, so he came to us with the lump on his eye, but it's probably doubled in size since he's been here, and wow. that's only over the last few weeks yeah. to a month, yeah. Just quick. Mm. When Lyndall mentions the fact this lump has grown so quickly over the last month, that really worries me. The lump is firm. It feels like it's got two parts to it. OK, yep. I don't think it's attached to the bone around his eye. Yep. But I'm not sure how deep it actually pushes in. And that's probably the, the bit that worries me the most. OK. I'm trying to keep a bit of a poker face because I don't really want to give away my concerns over this lump in front of Tash. I'm glad you actually wrote to me when you did, because if you were to leave that for any longer, then if it is something nasty, it could so easily just grow straight into his eye. And from there, there's not much that can be done. Yeah. In a paddock with only very basic equipment, it's very hard to give them a definitive diagnosis about what's going on with Charlie. To get a true answer, what we need is a biopsy. Look, there's not too many jobs at the park that rattle me. Not too many that scare me, but female alligators are one of them. They're pretty terrifying. It's alligator breeding season at the Australian Reptile Park. Hey, boys. Today's mission for operations manager Tim Faulkner is to retrieve yeah. freshly laid eggs. Yeah, sitting just in front of the nest. Oh, she's out already. Let's get in. But first, he has to get past some extremely aggressive mums. Right up, on your toes, boys. For Tim and the team, it's a dangerous race against time. Oh, here she comes already. Our climate here is too hot. It's not like where gators are naturally from in the States. We need to get those eggs out before today's sun hits them because they will overheat and die. You gonna play nice, Shirley? Please settle. The process is pretty simple on paper. Hey. We catch the female, remove her from the nest, collect the eggs, and then let her go. Sounds simple, but it's not that easy. Jason, how are you going? Mate, thanks Ace for coming, That's mate. Right. Thanks no for coming. No problem so with Mal, our, yeah. our spider monkey, mate. He's, um, we come in this morning, we saw his mouth swollen and okay. a bit of blood coming out. Let's get zoom down here. You can see his jaw all swollen. Yeah. 
we're really concerned about Mal because he's, he's producing a little bit of blood out of, uh, out of that swelling in his jaw. So um, it really is an emergency to get him looked at today. As you know yourself, if you have a sore mouth, it really does affect everything in your life. It affects your mood, it affects how well you can eat, and really just simple tasks become incredibly difficult. It is a worry if he's, if he's not eating well, but also to have a look at that's going to be a challenge. A male would definitely bite you, and he will scratch and he will grab a hold of you. So they're quite a powerful primate. We're going to need to sedate him, and I mean, that's not going to be easy. He's not going to open something and say, ah, I don't think, no. is he? So, no, uh, he's not. It's all in your capable hands. Hi, Angel. Hi, Andrew. What's with Ollie? Um, Ollie's got a, a limp on his left side. How long has he been like that? About three weeks. So he wasn't lame before that? No. Yeah. Get you to trot him down there for sure. me. Hey, Jazz. Specialist surgeon Andrew Marchewski has been treating Angel's pets for years. Just a bit quicker. Go. Okay. Good boy. Okay. Right. right. So not had any other lamenesses? No. Nothing. Good boy. You're all right. Hey, no. No. As soon as you get to that elbow and put a little bit of pressure on the inside part of it, he's, he's not happy. He's pulling away and having a bit of a gnaw at my hand. So he's certainly sore on that point. Good boy. Yeah, I know. Don't you? Did, did your mother teach you to do that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're not allowed to bite the vet. No. Especially Andrew. That's right. He's not sure up in his shoulder or down in his wrist, but that elbow seems to be the problem. This is Sheba. This is one of our cats. Uh, she is going to have an interesting time with the dogs, I think. Absolutely. She owns this place. Pets enrich your life in such a way nothing else can. It's one thing having a family, but pets bring a completely different dimension to it. Introducing the cats to the dogs will be a major thing because I don't want the dogs to see the cats as toys, and I don't want the cats to scratch the puppies either. I want a happy household if I can help it. I would definitely be keeping them quite separate in the separate beginning, in the beginning. Okay. for quite a few months. Just like you can't force people to like each other. If they like each other, they like each other, and if they don't, they don't. Oh, yeah, we have a lot to learn. This is the fastest animal on Earth, over 300 k's an hour. What that means is that they're a heavy-bodied bird. If he fledged and he wasn't quite ready to fly, he's going to hit the ground really hard, uh, and that's what might have happened. Before beginning an examination, Tim decides his new patient needs a name. What about Malcolm? Malcolm the Falcon. You like that? Malcolm the Falcon? Let's have a look at you, mate. His wings look good. No obvious brace. He's only a young bird. You see up here on the top, these white feathers? That's the down, the chick down. So he's at a point where he's just left the nest, he's just fledged. Tim is convinced Malcolm hasn't suffered any critical injuries to his body. His attention now turns to the falcon's head. And there's something that stands out straight away to me, and that is, I wave my hand here, and the head turns, he can see the hand. I put my hand here, on the left side, he's not reacting at all. That's a big worry. He can't live in the wild with one eye. He needs two. Their vision allows them to see many hundreds of metres to isolate a particular prey item. And without both of them, there's no future for him in the wild. Are you sure. willing to have a crack? I'll have a go, yeah. All right. We have to get him down before he decides to disappear into another tree overnight. Can you see how much of this ladder's moving? Are you oh, doing that? That's me as well. <laughs> Are you doing that? I'm nervous for you. I think he's on to you. Hey, mate. Every man needs his space. But this is taking it to the extreme, Baz. The problem is that I can't really reach him from here. The cockies are having a laugh, anyway. I don't know. Oh, everyone's having a laugh. I'll get to you later, cockies. Chris has been called to a local park to meet with Anna. Uh, i got a funny feeling. <laughs> this, is, this is why I'm here, right? Yes, this is James. Her pet mini pig's behaviour is causing some big problems. He's a bit of a demolition man, isn't he? I think he can dig a hole faster than I could with a shovel. 
The council is not appreciating the holes that he's putting in the park and they're asking me to keep him on the lead at all times, even in an off-leash park. <laughs> To be honest, I came down here thinking, oh, geez, the council's overreacting again. But you see the holes he digs. He is making a mess down here. Thanks, James. This foraging behaviour, this digging, is a normal thing for pigs to do. But here in the city, it doesn't work because the council are really on Anna's tail. I think they're at the point of almost asking me to not take him to the park. I guess the only other solution is for me to move to a rural area, and I certainly don't want to do it, but the last thing I want to do is have to give him up. I love him. I couldn't imagine not having him around. Right. Most of the time they get along, and there's a real social hierarchy from big boys right down to tiny little hatchlings. Now, Brutus is at that point in his life where he's ready to become top dog. The risk is if we leave Brutus, that he's going to try and throw it over these old boys. That's going to end in serious injury, possibly death. Ah, that's our gator. Look, he's just sitting there, standing his ground, doesn't want to move. Everyone else is scattered, and the king's just holding his ground. Hey, hey, hey. We can't catch Brutus in the water, even though we're only a metre from him now. There's a few risks. One is that he pulls us straight in. Two is that if we happen to get a rope on and let's say Brutus was too strong and he pulled away, he could then be stuck underwater with a rope wrapped around his head and we don't want that. With Brutus now located, Tim will attempt to entice the deadly killer to the bank so he can be captured. Righto, mate, we'll see you in a little while. My initial thought was he had a stroke. It looked like a human that had had a stroke. Bring him through. Emergency vet Dr Lisa Chimes needs to urgently assess the six-year-old. Hey, honey, your world's upside down. What's happened? He just went down, his eyes started flickering, and he just couldn't stand. He couldn't, like, he was all over the place. So what we really need to do now is work out, is this a problem going on in his brain? Yeah. Or is this a problem going on outside of his brain? Right. So somewhere, like, in the ears? Yeah. OK, so I'm just going to pop him on the floor, see what he can do. Come here, baby. Oh, come here, baby. Hello, come here. There's something going on with Bello that is affecting the nerve that's controlling his balance. He's not too steady at all. There's a whole variety of things it could be, and we need to do some more tests to work out why. So I'm going to have a look inside his ears, see if there's any problems there. That one looks pretty good. So his ears look actually pretty clean. There's no inflammation. There's nothing I can see down that ear canal that's causing any issues. That doesn't necessarily rule out ear problems, OK? Because okay? yep. I'm just looking at the outside, outside ear canal. Not, you know, exactly. Yeah. Bello will now undergo a CT scan to determine if the problem is within the inner ear or the brain. Hey, what's going on? Problems inside the brain could be something like a stroke, mm -hmm. something like a tumour in his brain, some sort of inflammatory disease in his brain. Just getting better. Very nerve-wracking, yeah. All right. Just hope it doesn't turn out to be the worst. Honey, I know you're dizzy. You're dizzy. The worst case scenario would be that Bello's got a brain tumour, and I really, really hope that's not something I'm going to have to tell Melinda. Not that good. What's that, Cookie? What's that? I've been doing this for about three or four months now, and it's one of the highlights of my month. <laughs> and just to see these people's faces, oh, it's an amazing feeling when you go home. You're walking home on, on cloud nine. Dr Mark Westman started the free monthly clinic to help those struggling financially to care for their pets. A pet in the park is really designed to look after Sydney's homeless and severely disadvantaged. Some of our clients will feed their animals before they feed themselves. And so we want to tie in and do what we can to help out their animals and hopefully also help out the owners at the same time. This is Rodney, hey, Rodney and Di. Hey, Di, how are you going? Chris's first patient is six-month-old Isabella. Owner Rodney is worried about his little girl. Oh, we heard about the pets in the park and I thought it would be a good opportunity to come and just find out if she was pregnant. She's not just sex, so we're not sure. Okay. I certainly know what you mean. She's a little bit 
rotund, a little bit pear-shaped. So we need to work out why that is. Yeah. You know, every so often you meet someone who's making a real difference. In Thailand, a guy called Edwin Week is famous and sometimes infamous for his work to save and rehabilitate wildlife that seemingly have no hope. At his rescue centre, he looks after more than 400 different animals. And I know they're always in need of volunteers, so that's where I'm heading now. Let's see if I can lend a hand. Chris has travelled 125 kilometres south of Bangkok to help out the Wildlife Friends Foundation. It's run by Dutch-born Edwin Wick and his team of dedicated volunteers. Hello. Oh, wow. Hello, how how are you, Edwin? It's Hi, great to see you, buddy. Good to see you again. Hello, Hi, Noi. Noi. How are you? <laughs> Look at you. Say hello. Say hello to Chris. You oh. know, I associate you with monkeys, but normally not quite as cute as this. Yeah. No, uh, these are actually leaf monkeys. Yeah. It's not like the little buggers that we saw last time. Not as naughty. <laughs> not as naughty. I first met Edwin last year when I travelled to a town called Lopperie, which has been totally overrun with monkeys. Oh, that's your guy. <laughs> now, they came in from the forest, lured in by the promise of food offerings from the local temple, but now there are so many, they can't possibly all find food. They'd struggle without this sort of feeding, wouldn't they? They wouldn't be able to survive without handouts. Yeah, it's a hell of a handout too. <laughs> It really impressed me and it made me interested to see what other work Edwin does. That's part of the reason I wanted to come back. And I would have driven in further, but you had a fairly large roadblock there. Yeah. This is uh, one of the rescued elephants called Boon Mi, rescued from the streets of Thailand, basically a begging elephant. She's about 60 years old and she's retired. And the only thing she does is eat, sleep and poo. It's a, it's a reticulated python, right? Yep. I was hoping for a Burmese python because oh, they're easier to handle. Yeah, no, so these ones I. are <laughs> These ones are very tough. I was hoping for something a little smaller. Yeah. So we're going to see one bear now. Uh, Pepsi, yep. she's a bear rescued about eight years ago and she needs to get a dental uh, treatment probably. First of all, to check her out. It's Chris's second day at the Wildlife Centre and his next challenge is to treat an aggressive sun bear that's in pain. Pepsi has developed a lot of tartar inside a mouth, on the teeth. There's concern they're sore, so my job today is to check them out. Give us a smile. Oh, good girl. Good girl. This is the bear they're talking about. Not so close. <laughs> <laughs> she can reach through there. Oh. Pepsi was uh, rescued from a temple and looked after by monks, and as is often the case, has a terrible diet before she came here. <laughs> The fact she had a poor diet meant that her teeth just never really have been in good shape. Since she's come in here, she's had a long history of dental problems, and today we're determined to make sure there's no serious issues in there. Every now and then, I do just get a little glimpse of those, those discoloured teeth. Just the brown coating, the lower canine looks quite dark as mm -hmm. well. And we want to catch it before it turns into full abscess and then the bear can't eat. This way, come on. It's not that abnormal for dogs to leak urine when they're a little bit excited or when they're old. But for Safira at her age to be doing it on quite a large scale is a bit of a worry. She might be lying in bed yeah. and all of a sudden she'll get up and there's a big wet patch. But Very it's like everyday constant. Other than that, perfectly beautiful, normal. Yeah. Definitely part of the family as all, all the animals are part of the family. I know we shouldn't treat them like children but they are. My darling. It's, it's clear that you, you really do love her. It, it must be getting hard, though, with, with all the dripping. It, yeah, it does, especially when you change the sheets half a dozen times or whatever. Just wash but the just theater. watching her get upset is enough yeah. to put a tear in your eye. Yeah. So let's take this nappy off. Can I get you just to hold her up there? Hey, Jeff. That's not exactly what I expected. What's there? Well, she just doesn't look entirely normal there. I know that Joe and Lorraine are staring at me going, why is he taking so long to speak? But Safi is not your typical female dog. Do you mind if I just take her out the back just for a second? Is this something we should be worried about? No, just, I just want to have a closer look. Okay. Yeah. 
When I look at Safira's belly, honestly, I'm totally confused. Hi, what's happening? Today, SASH emergency vet Lisa Chimes is volunteering her time at the shelter. Let's just scan her and see if she's actually chipped. No chip. No microchip, darling. Hey, sweetheart. Where's your family? All right, so I'll just take her over to the clinic. We'll have a good look at her and see what's going on with that leg. OK, great. Okay. Fantastic. Come on. See you, darling. I couldn't imagine anything more heartbreaking than losing your pet, but if they're not microchipped and there's no identification on them, there's no way that we can find out who they belong to. So the shelter's taken her over and now we're going to have a look at her leg. Hopefully there's nothing serious going on there, but we have to sort that out first. Hey, you really are limping. Looking around, I've got to say, it is like you're in Africa. Yes, yeah, I grew up in a big game reserves in Africa and this is the best job I reckon I could have. Landscape-wise, there's a lot of it that feels like home and certainly the types of animals you see around you. Chris is at Werribee Open Range Zoo, just outside Melbourne. He's been called out to help with a very special patient. You're worried about one of the cheetahs here? Kaidi has not been eating as he usually does. We hope that an examination will reveal if there is anything wrong. And with your help, maybe we can, we can get there and figure that out today. We heard that cheetahs are one of Chris's favourite animals and uh, we thought we wanted to give him a call so he can come and you know, help out with the whole process. So we've got Inkasana on the left. Yeah. He's got a white patch on his tail and Kaidi um, on the right over here. Brothers Inkasana and Kaidi have been residents at the zoo for more than seven years. Uh, so what's got you so worried? Well, just notice with Kaidi, he hasn't been eating as, as he normally does. They normally have relatively small meals. They don't sort of go for days without food, like, like lions, for instance, eat a big meal and then maybe go for a few days without. These guys tend to eat most days. It's not eating is unusual for him. You know? I'm, not, I'm not happy. I, I, I'm just not sure. I'm not, I'm not at ease with, with the way things are. He's so consistent with taking his food. It's very seldom that he doesn't. If, if any cat has a weakness, it, it's going to be their kidneys, isn't it? And... Hi, I'm Dr Danny Dusek from Bondi Vet. If you love our show and want to see more, plus some amazing content about pets and how to care for them, hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you on our next video.